Howdy folks, Shell Presto de Baggio here again with another highly detailed ink drawing that I did for, you guessed it, Bexham's Bazaar magazine. As I draw this babe and a big Gamera-esque monster, I'll be sharing more dungeon mastering advice, talking about this artwork, and reading some awesome fiction about this character. However, unlike my previous Bexham's Bazaar work, today's drawing does not take place in a medieval fantasy setting, but in our true canon Ascension Epoch. It's set in the late 1890s during the Martian War and features a selkie that's like a mermaid except part seal instead of fish. As a matter of fact, my subscribers might recognize this selkie. It's Maureen McCrory, based off of the public domain heroine Maureen Maureen, created by Harold DeLay. If you want to know more about the original Maureen and how we adapted her for the Ascension Epoch, I'll link to my public domain redesign video on her at the end of this video and in the description. So in previous videos, we've been talking about the hurdles associated with being a dungeon master or game master and how to overcome them. Today we're going to talk about a problem near and dear to my heart coming up with a plot for your first adventure, and keeping the names of towns, landmarks, gods, and most especially, NPCs straight. NPC is short for non-player character, the many people your players will interact with. They may be the town mayor, the boat captain who hires the players to protect his ship and the crew, the king who asks you to save the princess and his court, or the barkeep and serving wench at the local tavern. If you have a hard time remembering names, if you were the sort of person who only memorized names and places for that week's history test and promptly forgot them after the test, or never memorized them in the first place, we all have that subject that's hard for us. If you can't name all of the states or countries on your corner of the world, if you're like me, who, upon my first attempt reading The Lord of the Rings, got confused because names like Sauron and Saruman, Eowyn, Arwen, Elrond, and Aragorn just got jumbled in your head, then even playing an RPG session from a pre-made adventure book can seem daunting. After all, you're the GM. You're supposed to be in control here. You certainly don't want to feel embarrassed having to flip through your adventure book to double-check what was the air pirate's name again or have a player correct you. I thought the captain's name was Robert, not Robert. So what can you do to make your first adventure easy to remember? Well, here's what I did, and many other GMs before me. Have you ever had a book, or video game, or anime that you really, really love, and you're always telling your friends to check it out, to read it, to play it, or watch it, and they never do? Stop telling them to watch it, because you no longer want them to. It is now your first adventure, or at least a tweaked setting for one. Take something you really love, that you know forwards, backwards, and inside out, that no one else playing knows, and just make that your setting. Change it to match the type of game you're playing, of course, and know that your players aren't going to play the plot out directly. It's going to change. But if you know the NPCs they'll be interacting with, if you know the next town over in advance in case they breeze through this one, if you have a cast in the back of your mind, you can much more easily adapt when one of the players pisses off the king because his character convinces the princess to elope with him before the party returns her to her father with a new son-in-law. You'll have to adapt the setting of your chosen book, video game, etc. to the setting you're playing in, of course. That may mean changing a sci-fi adventure to a medieval fantasy, or a modern urban fantasy to a 1920s Lovecraftian horror setting. But you get the point. Also, pick something obscure. Using Star Wars or Lord of the Rings isn't going to work. And make sure it's not cued to be a movie soon. For example, your friends may not have read Dune or watched the old movie or TV series, but a new movie is coming out soon, and they may see that, so that would be a really bad pick. Really, the more obscure the better. The very first time I took on the role of Dungeon Master, I had a couple medieval fantasy short stories my friends hadn't read yet, but virtually no world building done for them. 
I used three of the characters I made up for my main NPCs who would occasionally travel with the players and guide them to an adventure, and sometimes get captured or otherwise imperiled to move the player characters in the right direction. But I fleshed out the world and used town maps from the video games Fantasy Star and Fantasy Star 4. Those are actually a strange but wonderful combination of sci-fi and medieval fantasy. So they worked well, and they were old 2D RPGs. My friends were all either light on video games or playing newer at the time stuff like Halo 2 or Resident Evil 4. Yep, old references again. So, realistically, the odds of them stumbling into the old Fantasy Star games were low. But to this day, I can remember that Aiedo is the town where the Hunter's Guild is located. Tanoe is filled with barbarians, and Reshel is an arctic town with a zombie problem. So, obviously I wasn't going to get that messed up in the game if it was well in my head over ten years ago, uh, and still is today. Likewise, you can lift bits and pieces from various things to make it whole. If I need a mining town, there's no reason I can't just lift Narsh from Final Fantasy 3 slash 6 or Corel from Final Fantasy 7. Anything that sticks out in your head is a good candidate. When I first started playing D&D, my DM knew we hadn't read... Ready for it? Lord of the Rings. This was before the movies had come out, so he used that universe to fill in his gaps. The player characters stayed at the Prancing Pony Inn and were guided by a mysterious ranger named Strider. We never met Bilbo, which is a good thing, because it would have clued us in. We had all read The Hobbit, but there's another example. In the first game I ever played, not as a dungeon master, uh, they were my DM was lifting things that he knew to remember things and make it easier on himself. When you're first getting into dungeon mastering, there's a lot you're going to have to remember. So don't be afraid to fill in your universe with what you know at first. That'll let you focus on learning new things like the rules and uh, mechanics. It's your world for the players, so you can build on it or adjust as you get more comfortable. And don't fret, you will get more comfortable. Okay, time for your fluff. I'm reading an excerpt from a future Martian War Chronicles book. The first book, Population of Loss, is available right now from Amazon and other online booksellers. A bit of background before I start reading. This excerpt focuses on Maureen and Jameson Doyle. While working as a railway signalman on the Severn Valley Line during the opening days of the Martian invasion, Jameson Doyle encountered a wounded Eldil while trying to warn off a refugee train in jeopardy of being derailed. For his valor and compassion, the Supernal bestowed three lenses on Jameson, making him the first human celestial paladin of the modern age. In this excerpt, Jameson, who is still getting used to his role as the hero signalman, found the injured Marine washed up along a canal. She looks perfectly human as far as he can tell, although he also found a strange, warm animal pelt clinging about her feet. He used the blue lens of his lantern to heal her, and brought her to the home he's staying at. All right, on with the story. The Metal Hands of the Wall Clock the bronze crucifix, and the bare metal hooks on the wall of the room suddenly gave off a lurid glow. When Doyle released his grip on the shell, the sensation slowly faded. Here is another mystery, Doyle thought, frowning. He sat in the wicker chair in the corner of the room and looked over the sleeping girl until he finally dozed off. That night, he dreamed of a rain of fire from the sky that burned up half the land and a many-headed dragon that rose from the sea, its huge body hiding the stars, as its wake swamped all the land that remained. A shrill scream woke him. Doyle shot out of the chair, poised on the balls of his bare feet. His eyes swept the room for danger, but saw nothing except the girl, awake now, 
huddled at the far corner of the bed. He startled at first sight of her, this howling apparition, pallid skin and luminous eyes coalescing out of a mist of knotted bedsheet. Her damp hair and cheekbones stood out in spectral sharpness against the blue-tinted shadows, all the warm hues of life washed out by the ghostly output of the lantern. He blinked at her, and she stared back at him, her expression uncomprehending. She drew in a deep breath and screamed again. Realizing that he must have looked quite as eerie to her as she did to him, Doyle rushed to turn off his lantern and light the hurricane lamp on the bureau, all the while shushing her and whispering reassurances. You're safe. I won't harm you. I found you on the edge of the canal, alone and injured, and I brought you to my home. He turned with the lit paraffin lamp and nodded at the girl, who, although the look in her eyes told him she was not fully persuaded, had at least stopped screaming. I want to help you he told her. The woman's taut limbs relaxed somewhat, and she unwound her skinny arms from around her legs. My name is Jameson, he said softly, setting the lamp down on the nightstand. Will you tell me your name? The question seemed to catch the young lady off guard. She wore an odd look on her face, with her lips parted on the verge of speech and her brow scrunched in concentration. Her pupils bounced from wall to wall, as if searching the room for the answer. Finally, she said, in soft mezzo-soprano, My name is Maureen, I think. She raised the back of her hand to her forehead and closed her eyes. Yes. Yes, of course, my name is Maureen. Maureen McCrory. She smiled then, and shook her head bashfully. I'd forgotten it though I can't imagine why. I've had it all my life. Doyle cleared his throat and forced a smile. I dare say. Maureen sat up, bundling the sheet against her naked breasts. I thank you for coming to my aid, but I must... I must... Her words trailed off, lost in the fog behind her eyes. Doyle looked at her with solicitude. Please don't be alarmed, Maureen, but I found you that way. Naked, I mean. Naked? Marine gasped. Good heavens! Her brittle voice cracked. I'll find suitable clothing for you presently, but first, can you recall how you came to be at the canal? She bit her lip and shook her head stiffly. I recollect nothing. Her shining ultramarine eyes, so large and round, looked up and beheld him through a blur of water. Where am I? Sharpness, he said. Sharpness? Yes, in Gloucestershire, alongside the Severn. You are alongside the canal that runs up to Gloucester. Gloucester? This name had an air of significance, though Maureen seemed not altogether sure what the significance was. She touched her forehead again and leaned forward in concentration, her long, yellow-orange locks falling over her face. I dimly remember something important about Gloucester she said. The fear and shame left her voice now, and there was strength, if not certainty, in her words. My father spoke of it. He said... Marine's shoulder suddenly heaved. Oh, God, what's happening to me? Of course I remember Gloucester. I'm from Gloucester. Doyle came to her side. Maureen, you've been through a terrible shock. Try not to worry yourself, and rest now. She grabbed him digging her nails into his bare arms. Why can't I remember? Why can't I remember? She buried her face in his shoulders, convulsed with sobs. He had just wrapped his arm around Maureen's shoulder when she suddenly flung her head up, a look of wild panic in her eyes. The invaders! The invaders are in Gloucester! That's why Father took us down to Cardiff, and now we've come back! No, Maureen. The Martians were in Gloucester. There was a terrible battle, but we were victorious. Maureen, we drove them back. Maureen clasped her hands and held them to her trembling chin. Victorious, she repeated, as if the very notion were absurd. She met his eyes with an intensity bordering on ferocity. I wish to God you would tell me the truth rather than try to calm me with well-intentioned lies. I am less a child than I look, and I can shoulder ill tidings as well as good. 
I have no doubt of that, Doyle said. But what I said is the truth, and you can rest assured of it. His voice was strong and steady, a voice that told her she could depend on the truth of every word. For the first time in days, he was the signalman again. Maureen laid her hand on her chest and breathed a sigh of relief. Thank God! But see here, Maureen, the battle ended more than a week ago. What is the last day you remember? Again, she struggled for an answer. I... I'm not sure. I remember being in Cardiff and seeing Father off to his ship. Was he heading back to Gloucester by chance? Suggested Doyle. Perhaps you followed after him later. No. He was going off to sea. I don't remember why. We quarreled that morning. I begged him not to go, or else to take me with him. I was afraid that we should be separated. Oh, I do remember now. It was August 1st. I remember because it was mother and father's anniversary, and I always made little gifts for them. Maureen's countenance fell, and for a little while she said nothing. When she went on, her voice was very soft. I stopped making them after she died, but that morning I had decorated a little box for his compass. I said I would only give it to him if he stayed, and then... Oh, how frustrating! My mind is a fog. For an instant I can see the outline of a fact behind it, but as soon as I reach for it, it vanishes. What day is today? The 10th of August. The 10th? You must be teasing. I wish I were, or rather, I wish that there was not so large a gap in your memories. Nine days, she muttered. A week and more gone, and I can't remember any of it. It's as if I slept through it all, like some maiden from a storybook put under an evil spell, or something equally dreadful. The poor girl's voice cracked, and she began to shiver. Doyle reached his hand toward her once again in comfort, but she jerked back at his touch. He started to apologize, but very quickly she remastered herself and looked at him with a fragile smile. Nine days in which the whole world has changed, she said. You must catch me up on it, Jameson. I want to know all about the great victory in Gloucester. Doyle hesitated, caught off guard by her abrupt change in disposition. He was only too happy to change the subject for Maureen's sake, but he did not relish the one she'd settled on. I will tell you what small part of it that I know, if you wish. I do wish. Finally, the army has put a stop to these invaders, and I missed it. All the news had been defeat after defeat. It seemed so hopeless. An army, at any rate. Doyle corrected her. And I would not say, put a stop to them. The Martians are still here and by all accounts, are the masters of two-thirds of the island, and perhaps many other places in the world besides. We've won a respite, but it won't last. Before I forget, I wanted to tell you fine folks that the publisher of Bexham's Bazaar magazine made issue 6 free to download from DriveThruRPG, so I'll leave a link in the description. It's a pretty cool magazine for folks who like to work on RPG and wargame terrain, and there's adventure fodder in there too. Plus, this picture of Maureen is in there, and you can read the second Incorrigible Imps comic strip by yours truly. I encourage you to check it out. Alright, so what is notable about the drawing itself? The first thing is that Selkies can take their seal skins on and off, so I had to be careful to pose Maureen in a way that implied she had functioning human knees. Part of the fun of drawing sea creatures like mermaids is that their tails can bend or wind or spiral uh, in fantastic directions, but I couldn't do that here without making Maureen's legs look broken, which would be bad. Whenever you're dealing with underwater scenes, you should strive to give a sense of floating, especially because if the character isn't near the ocean bottom or the water surface, there's not always a clear way to signify where they are. After all, if your character is breathing through water, there won't always be an easy tell, like bubbles, which would only occur when air is trapped underwater. 
So, what are some tells you can do to signify a character is underwater if there's no sand or coral below them or the uh, layer of top surface ocean water breaking above them? You can start by giving the character a pose that works underwater but would appear off balance if they were attempting to stand on regular ground with regular gravity. Maureen couldn't balance on the tip of her fin if she were on land, and even if she could, if she tried to while leaning over like this, she'd fall right over. So the pose immediately defies physics that would occur above ground in a way that says she's swimming. Next, make things that can float seem like they're floating. You'll see that Maureen's shell necklace is not laying against her chest, but floating above it and casting a dark shadow for emphasis. In addition, her hair isn't laying like it would if she were subject to gravity on land. When you're drawing underwater hair, you should have it moving in the opposite direction that your character is moving in. Uh, if Maureen were swimming quickly to the right, her hair would be trailing behind her to the left. But she's relatively stationary in this piece, blocking someone's way or guarding something. So she's just pretty much floating in one place or treading water. Can you tread water when you have a no legs? Anyway. When this happens underwater, you want the hair to curve and float upward a bit. And you want to do it erratically on both sides. This differentiates it from windswept hair, which all moves in one direction. Maureen's hair is billowing up and to the left, while individual curls also stream up and to the right. Unless you're going for symmetry, it's more visually interesting to have different shapes on different sides. I went more for a mass of hair on our left, her right, and a couple thinner spirals on our right, her left. By making the spirals large, I also aided in conveying those underwater physics again. I spent a lot of time debating what sort of top Marine should be wearing. She usually lives on land, so I don't think she'll be making or carrying around shell bras. Plus, she's likely to have to jump into action at a moment's notice without too much warning. On the same token, though, it seems really odd to draw her in a blouse or undershirt while underwater. It is the Victorian era, so I imagine she'd want to cover herself. And in the end, I imagine she's wearing someone's ripped-off shirt sleeves or hem tied about her chest. That also gave her a ragged look, similar to, say, Sheena or Shanna the Jungle Queen, uh, but underwater. Finally, when you look at the finished picture, you'll see that I added more depth with digital screen tones. I chose a screen tone that scales well, one that doesn't use dot matrices to make a pattern, so it wouldn't give the publisher a headache if he had to resize it. I lowered the opacity so you could still see the ginormous sea turtle beast clearly, but also to make him clearly in the background and Marine up front and the focal point by leaving Marine pretty darn light. I added a bit of tone at an even lower opacity, that means it's lighter, to the bottom of Marine's fins so that you get a feel of underwater depth and darkness there, too. As a reminder, Marine will appear in future Martian War Chronicles books. You can pick up the first Martian War Chronicles book, Population of Loss, on Amazon or other online booksellers. There's two steampunk stories, a paranormal Wild West tale, and a fairy tale in there, penned by my husband and I, and featuring art by yours truly. And like I said, you can check out Bexham's Bazaar number no. 6 for free. Okay folks, that's it for this one. If you have any questions or comments about D&D, the story I read, or the art, do let me know in the comments. Please give the video a like if you uh, liked it. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to catch my other videos. Have an awesome day, folks. Presto, over and out. Part of me was tempted to build this uh, art video as a public domain redesign, 
just because this is, was my first time drawing Dietz the turtle. In the original Maureen Marine comics, King Neptune and Queen Maureen have a uh, giant sea turtle that is their steed named Dietz. Much like animal sidekicks, uh, I got attached to Dietz because, you know, he's a cute turtle animal sidekick. What's not to love? Unfortunately, he doesn't last very long. A squid attacks King Neptune and Marine, and unfortunately, uh, the squid grabs Dietz and they take the opportunity to run away. I mean, they didn't have weapons, so I guess they didn't have much choice, but nonetheless, do not get too attached to Dietz. The original is not a survivor. However, we make him a bit more interesting in the Ascension Epoch. I will probably do another video on Dietz as a public domain redesign, particularly because I haven't drawn all of him. As you can see, you can only see his part of his face in this uh, drawing. So if you want to know when the full redesign happens, make sure to subscribe, folks. In the meantime, hope you all have an awesome day. Presto, over and out. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?